welcome everybody to the second session in the inaugural Meet the Governance Innovator Speaker Series. Um, I'm Carlos Centeno, the Associate Director of Innovation at the MIT Governance Lab. And to tell you more about the Governance Lab, for those of you who are not familiar with our work, it's my pleasure to introduce Lily Sai for Professor of Political Science and Director and Founder of the MIT Governance Lab. Lily. Thank you, Carlos, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of GovLab, we are excited to host the second conversation in our new event series on governance innovation, Meet the Governance Innovators. For those who have yet to connect with us, MIT Governance Lab, or MIT GovLab, is an implied research group and ideas incubator in the political science department that aims to improve democracy and governance by changing practice around corruption, government accountability, and citizen voice. Our model combines the best from behavioral science, experimental social science, design thinking, and evaluation to iterate on governance solutions that support people's ability to hold the government to account. We partner with in-country practitioners at every stage of the research and learning process, from theory building to theory testing, to critical reflections and adaptions and adaptations in real time with the goal of contributing to a solid evidence base and innovations to strengthen the overall field of practice for participatory governance. Before we get started, I wanted to again thank a few of our sponsors from the lab, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, whose vision helped spur the Governance Innovation Initiative. In addition, we're incredibly grateful to our supporters at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and other anonymous donors who broadly support the dissemination of GovLab's work. Now I'll turn it back over to Carlos, who will introduce you to our two wonderful speakers today. I'm extremely excited to see how this conversation evolves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the second series highlighting uh, thought leaders at the forefront of innovation and governance. And last time we had a great panel with uh, Dr. Jumoke Oluwole, a special advisor on the Isabun business um, to the president of Nigeria and Ademidia de Parasin, the design director at IDO.org. Um, and you can see a trend here with the, 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 the kind of speakers we are having today. Um, with this series, we're really trying to start a conversation about innovation and governance, um, a momentum that we hope will carry into ministries and design rooms, into academia, and uh, civil society organizations, where we hope you'll start uh, asking new questions about the role of technology, design, and other disciplines, and the relationship between citizens and government. We're hoping that the series is the beginning of a new way of designing governance, so that it increases trustworthiness and accountability in government. Um, with this initiative, the Governance Innovation Initiative, we, we really wanted to dive deeper in other disciplines and, and test some processes and technologies to answer some big questions. What motivates government to innovate, to think different? How do we design processes and solutions that increase accountability and trust between citizens and government? How do we design tech that distributes power? So we're building the sandbox for testing innovative tools and processes to design the future of governance through human-centered design, social, political, behavioral science, and of course, it's MIT, so technology. Uh, and like we're gonna be talking about later today, it doesn't have to be super sophisticated technology, it's just the technology that it's needed. And we'll get into that a bit. Beyond testing and tinkering, really our ultimate goal at the uh, Governance Innovation Initiative, as I mentioned, is to design the future of governance and develop the next generation of tech responsive leaders who are able to think different and capitalize on innovation to improve that relationship between citizens and government that I was uh, talking about earlier. Today, we'll have a conversation with our speakers, at the end of which we'll take some questions from the audience. So start thinking of those questions while you listen and drop them in the Q&A on the bottom of your screen. And we'll also make a special announcement at the end about a couple opportunities we're launching uh, in the next few days. All right, uh, on to our speakers. Um, I want to introduce uh, Arvind Gupta. Arvind is the former CEO of MyGov India, and he's the head, currently the head and co-founder of Digital India Foundation. Arvind has over 30 years of experience in leadership, policy, and entrepreneurial roles, both in Silicon Valley and in India. He's an Eisenhower Fellow for Innovation and an active member of the Industry Forum's NASCOM, 
TIE and founding member of Ice Spirit. He's a member of the World Economic Forum Digital Futures Council and OECD Initiative on Global Value Chains. He also mentors many startups, and I know this, I know this firsthand, <laughs> having uh, shared with Arvin uh, about three or four years ago. Um, Fernando Ma, our other panelist, is the design director of Future Directions at La Victoria Lab in Peru. Uh, he co-founded, uh, sorry, he founded Cuida.co, a health tech startup, and also worked at a leading financial and consulting organizations. Fernando holds a bachelor's degree in systems engineering from the University of Lima. Um, so great to have an engineer in the room and an MBA from Waseda Business School, Tokyo. Um, welcome both. This is gonna be a great conversation. We'd already started talking before everybody joined. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure we can just roll right through the first question. Um, for Arvin, Arvin, uh, tell us a little bit more about your background, you, you led MyGov India for so many years, for, for two years actually, and have been involved in digital governance for a while now. Tell us how you got involved with MyGov India and what you're working on at the moment. So thank you, um, uh, Carlos, for having me and thank you, uh, Professor Sai, for, for inviting us. And you know, uh, me and my co-panelist, Fernando. So my, now I, I wanna begin with saying that, that in India, you know, one of the things we have is a very diverse population. It's 1.35, 1.4 billion people speak 22 different uh, official languages, maybe 700, 800 dialects. And um, of course, uh, the, the diversity of uh, the population is very, very big in terms of both literacy as well as languages I just talked about and, 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 and uh, in terms of income levels. So... You know, I uh, what has fascinated me is that how um, I've always used technology at a very large scale. So being a computer scientist, uh, how, you know, um, at the forefront of the Internet revolution, I is, saw an opportunity of how to use technology to transform, uh, let's say, payments uh, long ago, or how do you use technology to transform learning um, and so basically my core thesis has been technology is a game changer in terms of solving problems at scale and, and solving problems at a much, much lower cost. Now this thinking is uh, even more important, uh, Carlos, when you come to the government, because now certainly uh, at a scale that India has, um, of course, a lot of programs are done, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which you know, need a lot of human intervention, a lot of on ground work, but technology has to be there as an accelerator at scale. So this is how I got pulled into um, you know, using technology for solving some societal problems. And I, I've been doing this as MyGov, as Digital India before and, and after, and, and many different roles uh, within the government. And it, is, it has been a very exciting journey. And you know what we have seen, and of course with India, everything is at population scale. Everything starts at about 100 million uh, users and goes on to a billion users so um we we've seen we've seen the impact that technology has made um over the last few years in improving citizens life and the biggest thing that has excited me personally is that this technology not only serves the top of the society which is generally the aim of you know um the new innovations our innovations are designed uh, design uh, bottom up which we basically means is we take care of the the lowest income uh, families, the lowest income households, when we design our solutions, our governance solutions, our, our communication solutions, our platforms, and, and then we go bottom up and making sure that everybody has a way to participate in it. And, um, and that has really transformed my thinking personally. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and that's the key difference between the work that we did, I did personally at Silicon Valley and I'm doing in India, is that Silicon Valley starts top down, which is innovating for the top. Whereas in India, our thinking is bottom up. We start with thinking about how you can solve for the bottom 1 billion, and then maybe that is a solution for the next 6 billion of the world. So that's uh, that's the approach, uh, Carlos. That's amazing. And that we're gonna get into that with uh, some of the different challenges of like um, building technology for hundreds of millions of people in such a complex um, ecosystem. Um, and it'd be fascinating to get your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Fernando, just so we know a little bit more about his background. We'll get back to that, uh, Arvin. Uh, Fernando, you've led startups um, in 
You're now design director at La Victoria Lab in Peru. Tell us how you got into design and, and what La Victoria Lab is and how it came out together. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, well, actually what, what Arvin was just saying resonates a lot with me, um, especially in, in the context in Peru, we, we also have this kind of fragmentation and disparity uh, across different socioeconomic levels and across different geographies. And we have like these three uh, main separate ecosystems that create a lot of barriers to entry in um, in bringing innovation and technology, but <clears throat> I, I think that technology as a foundation actually creates a lot of uh, possibility and, and, and can scale up a lot of uh, of <clears throat> of social good that we're trying to be to bring to the population. Um, but going back a little bit on on the question. Um, I think I've been doing, and many of us probably here in the panel have been doing design without actually naming it design. Uh, in my case, I've been creating digital products for consumers uh, for a long while, starting with, with a, a financial institution. Uh, but when I took my master's degree, I actually understood that I've been doing design all the way along. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been doing horrible design, <laughs> uh, not taking in, into account the, the user's perspective and, 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 and being run by my own biases. Uh, a transformation point for me in, in, in how I, I think about design and, and governance and, and how everything clicked is uh, when I was designing, we were designing a, um, <clears throat> A solution to improve the academic performance for higher higher education students, um, and we're trying to push tutoring and mentoring across uh, uh, different students and, and and sections, but we didn't get get the results that we wanted. Uh, what we started thinking about the user's perspective, having those those interviews, and really deeply understanding what are the concerns on each of them, uh, we kind of understood that it was not a problem of um, performance and, and knowledge, but a problem of confidence on, on the people. And when we started addressing that, we saw like a boom in performance. Um, and what we saw later is that in Peru, a lot of people have like this problem of confidence because of their background, because of what they lacked in, in education in, in, and, and the emotional problems that this fracturing culture actually brought um, um, into their, their livelihoods. So when we kind of cracked this code and understood that we, we had the power to actually empower the, uh, those people and have the power to change their lives and have the power to change actually uh, their future and their families, um, it was a revealing point for me that we could transform the life of a lot of, uh, of, a lot of people just um, by crafting and, and and creating better experiences and, and connecting better with, with the users. So at La Victoria Lab, we kind of do that. Uh, La Victoria Lab was founded in uh, 2014 and it started with a question on, uh, a basic question in, in, in how can we create affordable and world-class education for the middle class in Peru? Uh, and it, uh, and it goes back to the purpose of La Victoria and Intercorp. Uh, um, Intercorp this is one of the largest uh, corporations here in Peru. La Victoria Lab is the innovation lab for that. Sorry, sorry if I, I skipped that part. Uh, but as our vision, we want to make Peru the best place to raise a family in Latin America. Um, so our initial question, we, we, we thought that a key lever for that and and, um, and one of the main like problems and challenges that, that we had as, as Peruvians was that the level of education was was really poor. And we try we try to design this uh, this new education system thinking in how can we reach actually rural population, how can we reach actually um, those disattended and disenfranchised uh, people, but offer them really world-class education that can help them uh, achieve their goals. And for that, we partnered with IDEO uh, some time ago. And in NOAA schools, a new concept of, of 
of schools was created that now is in um, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, and, and it's kind of going all over the region. Uh, and it's been very, very successful. And as a part of that, um, and seeing the success of, of these solutions, we, we thought on how can we actually create an, an ideal at, um, at a local level in, in Peru. And that's, that's how La Victoria was born, right? Um, and we kind of continued partnering with, with them up to now to solve a lot of the challenges along the way. That's super interesting. I didn't know. I mean, I, I'd i read about uh, La Victoria in a book from an uh, editor from Wired and, and, and sort of the, the birth. I, I didn't know it, it began with the education and then like grew into La, the actual La Victoria. I thought it was La Victoria already set up and then they built the education uh, initiative. So that's really interesting how and one thing becomes the bigger purpose. Um, so that's that makes me think, um, uh, Arvind, uh, well, question for both of you. It sounds like building some of these um, initiatives to to rethink and, and reform the way things are done um, are super challenging. Uh, there is a reason why they're relatively new as well. So I, I wonder what what are some of those challenges you faced with the very first time you um, you enter this space and we're saying, well, let's do this in a different way. Um, what were people saying to you and what did you think of that? So let me go first, uh, Fernando. Um, you know, I'm going to give a small anecdote. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I, as I said, I've been an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And, um, and then that was, uh, you know, that's how I started my career building uh, technology for, for many things at scale. But when I came back to India, my, my father said, you know, if you can build a startup, if you can be an entrepreneur in India, you can be an entrepreneur anywhere in the world because it's, you know, it's like if you can drive in India, you can drive anywhere in the world. It's the most tough. And uh, the challenges it brings to it. And uh, it was tough. It was interesting. But then I think I topped it when I went to the government. So now my saying is, if you can be an entrepreneur inside the government, you can be an entrepreneur anywhere in the world because it's, 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 it's more challenging than you can ever imagine. But that's the challenge. It's challenging. It's not difficult. And it's a, it really requires not only innovation in the way you think, but you, how you execute. And uh, I think what, um, what we have done is uh, you know, now change the mindset and the attitude inside the government to make it a, a, you know, a kind of a, a, you know, a government as the biggest disruptor or biggest innovator. And that mind change, uh, mind shift uh, over the last seven, eight years is the biggest accomplishment. Today, the government feels it has to innovate. The government is competing uh, to innovate and it's actually creating an enabling environment um, for solving problems for three, four areas, right? So India, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of a very interesting context. India has now taken an approach to build digital public goods, digital public open goods. Now, unlike roads or electricity grids or, or waterways uh, or highways, what India has done is build digital infrastructure as a public good. Now it solves, and all, our, whether it was MyGov or it is uh, it has been our vaccination platform or its identity or payments, all of them are built with an approach of open and public good, which basically means solves problems for three. It's number one solves for the government itself. So the government itself becomes a consumer. So when we build platforms and I can talk at length about them, uh, government is solving its own problems of, and I'll give one example, using the identity and payment system, we actually deliver uh, benefits. And in doing so, uh, I think we've de delivered um, benefits worth maybe, you know, um, $200 billion and in the $250 billion and save $20 billion. How much it has costed to build us? $2 billion. So the government itself has got an ROI. Second is we've used this digital public goods to create a startup ecosystem. Now, last count, it says, you know, uh, we've created 100 unicorns built on this digital public goods of identity, payments, EKYC, MyGov, uh, because it, 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 it is an enabler for all of this. 
and the, the outcome, the valuation of these, uh, these startups is about $350 billion today. So, you know, this is just 100 unicorns that we have created. Then you extend it to society at large. And, and at society at large, businesses, today the senior citizens don't need to go out of their homes. And I was talking to uh, uh, Professor Sai before this conversation and explaining to her, we have immense high technology at the back end. That's where our kick is. But what we have done, we have ensured that the citizen sees the interface that they are comfortable with, in the language they are comfortable with. And, 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 um, and that interface can change, you know? So a senior citizen today needs to give in a proof of life to get their pension. They can do it at the comfort of their mobile phone, a smartphone. They can go to an assisted center and do it there. And, and, and uh, you know, so there is, there, is, there is a lot of choices on the front end of using technology at the back end. Now, uh, the proof of life comes from your iris scan and that iris scan says this is, this is you know, this, this is uh, also a, a attached to your identity, which goes and authenticates that this person is alive. So their pension should be given to their bank account, which is all, all interrelated. Now, a lot of technology at play, but the consumer, the citizen doesn't get it, uh, need to get involved with that technology. We have to make it very simple for them. So uh, I think there is a lot of um, uh, thing, things here that uh, that that we had to change as mindset. But today, the biggest thing from my colleague um, from a design thinking is keep the consumer in mind while designing complex technology. It's not technology which is important. It's the outcomes, and the outcomes have to be population scale at 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 a diversity that I just told you about. So, you know, for example, all our technologies, all our platforms, as complex AI, maybe sometimes at the back end, but the front end could be a messenger. Uh, a WhatsApp messenger, which is widely used in India. It could be a, it could be a mobile uh, phone. It could be a desktop. It could be voice. They can call in and do this, uh, do the same interaction. And uh, it could be an assisted center. So um, it, it's, it's, and it's all, it is all portable and tra transferable. It means I, I need not, I'm not tied in always to only a mobile device. I could next day decide to go somewhere else. So it is, um, uh, so Carlos, long story short, I think a couple of things. Government, center of innovation. Two, building digital public goods at population scale. Three, make the, making them open for society, for, for businesses, for startups, and for government. And in the process, really government really becoming the biggest innovator and the disruptor because it itself, you know, it's, it's challenging itself every year. That's what innovation should be. Um, and and, and uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, last point I do want to make is that uh, in this, uh, the, the biggest thing we keep in mind, as I said in my previous intervention, is making sure it is 100% inclusive, mm -hmm. that nobody is left behind. And that's the design principle. That's, the, that's a core design principle. It supports all languages. You know, it supports uh, lower literacy levels. And there is, a, there is a massive communication program before and after whenever we launch a new initiative, which is enabled by technology to make sure there is literacy, make sure people understand how to use it. And, um, and being a computer scientist, we use the divide and conquer algorithm to its best. So we divide large problems into smaller problems, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to learning. So we, you know, we use engineering students to go out and train people in how to use this technology better or how to use this thing better. So, yeah, and you know, um, we found 2 million engineers going around and teaching yeah. others so that suddenly we have a much more acceptance. So there's been a lot of um, innovation, as I said, in the whole value chain. It's just not design, it's design, technology, development, execution, acceptance. Yeah, and I wanna pick up on, on something you said that was really cool. Um, you mentioned that the, um, um, when you're building the digital public open goods, um, it had to have value for the government itself. So the government became the customers. It obviously had to have value for people. And that's something that we've been working on and, and thinking about with other governments and designers is the value proposition, which you both are familiar with in, in the startup world, the value proposition has to be not only for the citizen, um, but it's, it has to be a value proposition for the bureaucrats, the, the people who are doing the work in the government and offering those services for the citizens, uh, for them to be motivated to to innovate, to, to make it better, to continue using it, right? They have to use it too, not just the citizens. So that's really interesting because you also put it into, um, into funding terms, uh, how much the 
like what's the ROI you mentioned? Like how much is the money the, the government saving or how much are they making? Um, I wonder, Fernando, like um, when you were pitching this uh, um, idea or concept of the world class schools, what was your value proposition there for the government? Apart from the moral, social, you know, like what's the value proposition? On <laughs> well, I think that there's like efficiency returns and like you, you, you have like cost cutting and all the economic benefit returns, but you also have to think in terms of the personal gains that your stakeholder is going to get, right? Uh, and um, thinking in, I, I've dealt mostly with private sector, uh, as you know, uh, but in the times I've, I've dealt with the public sector, um, I think they're, they're very interested in, is in what's the political gain they'll get from an implementation like this, right? Uh, so how would it look to society? What's the, uh, the scale of the communication around that? And what's the reach, uh, the image and, and the, the, the public good image will, will, will get and, and as a mileage. I wanted to, 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 to build on to some Arvin's point in, in the last question uh, mm -hmm. around some of the challenges. And, and I think um, challenges in, in, in implementations, both in, in the public and, and private sector, a lot have to, to do with the organizational structure itself and with, this, the, with the same stakeholders that want you to innovate. <laughs> um, I think there, there are kind of three uh, main challenges I, I want to highlight here is that the first one is uh, the leadership anxiety, like the, the people that the stakeholder anxiety on uh, on the on on the horizon and the return of their investments, right? Um, being it like a private investor and and they want to see uh, a return on what they want to build, being a corporation and and wanting to to see uh, a project disrupt their industry, or being in the government. Uh, that want to see a, pl a project implemented in scale, implemented at scale. Um, one thing that, that's really, really important here is that when we think in terms of execution here, um, we're, we're usually thinking in what resources we have and what, what impact we'll make. And, and, and in the resources we think in, in, in terms of money and people uh, or time. But one thing that's critical, and we usually don't take it in, in, into account, it's trust. Right uh, and 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 trust as a resource um, from the stakeholders that are putting their 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 uh, their money and and their time and their confidence in, in what you're doing, but also if you're thinking from uh, the public side, the the the, the population itself that are, that are waiting for a solution that's that's going to come in the future. Uh, so dealing with this, the expectation and the trust they're, they're, they're giving you, you have to start delivering in, in small steps, uh, starting with um, the low hanging fruits and how, how can you start delivering in bit by bit so, so you can, at the same time as you deplete trust, you, you start creating new trust along the way. Um, and, and two other small things are, uh, as you're implementing things in, in, in environments you face, internal resistance, especially if you're perceived as like innovators are usually perceived as an outside force uh, that's gonna disrupt the current organization. It's probably, um, uh, and, and, and especially when you enter and, and innovation spaces are given like all the bells and whistles um, and, and naturally separate, like create a separate space from uh, the current and, and, and standing organization. So being able to be humble, creating space for interaction, for, uh, for, um, for connections with the, with the yeah, and empathy with, uh, with the current organization and whatever you want to transform, it's critical. Uh, just an example, when we, uh, I was developing an innovation lab for um, an education uh, company we created this space called La Cafeta Lab, uh, and basically it's like the cafeteria. Uh, and we we named our, our innovation lab the cafeteria as a way for people to, every, like every, everyone is welcome. It's a space for everyone to share. And it's kind of switched the mindset of the people that actually went to go and, and 
felt that this space was for them to use and for them to, to collaborate and create. Um, and all the thing is, um, I think it's really, really important is the team motivation because innovation usually, especially if you wanna create change at scale, um, takes a lot of time. Uh, and along the way, you deplete motivation, especially in your team, if, if you're navigating uncertainty, creating this maybe um, small wings and artificial wings uh, along the way it helps you a lot on, on creating those that, that gasoline that takes you further along the road. Um, so in, yeah. in, in my yeah, in my experience, I, I've used a lot of different things. Uh, one one thing that really helps us is dividing our milestone in, in small chunks. Uh, just not not the the launch of the product, but a small thing like launch on the the production environment or the first user that actually bought us something or the first user that actually registered their email. Uh, those small wins actually help boost confidence and building a system around it and, and thinking how can we keep motivation along the way and how can we um, actually design uh, intentionally for that. It's, it's really critical for the success of any initiative you want to build. So uh, yeah, I was actually in a in a class at MIT um, where the professor was well. The, actually, no, the students were mentioning how in um, systems engineering design you release your versions and try to get the, try to get those small wins so that they're internally approved in the company as the actual software. There's no launch, um, you know, and and so that that strikes a, a core there and. I wonder, so like, it's almost like you are pitching every step of the way to convince more people, bring more people on, building that fuel that you were saying. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering, I'm thinking of India too. Like, how do you how do you do small wins in India? <laughs> A small win in India sounds like 50 million people. Like, how do you do small wins? How do you get enough people on the network to believe in your product or your solution like Fernando was uh, hinting at? Now, that's a great question, Carlos. This is the toughest thing. It's, it, it also relates to what Professor Sai was saying. It's trust in technology, trust in the government, right? I mean, how, um, you know, one of the theses that I have is that trust in um, government uh, translates to trust in technology. And that trust really brings about more, uh, more adoption much faster because there is this whole um, mistrust about data, data sharing. I'm, am I giving my data to the right person? So adoption will really uh, uh, depend on trust. But this is where you know platforms, participatory uh, platforms, and participatory governance—the two-way governance we talk about—comes into play. Um, uh, Mynga, my my uh, my platform that I used to head previously, uh, is 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 in the business of um, uh, you know uh, doing this, uh, making sure that decisions, technologies are not decided and then just given uh, or implemented on citizens, whether it's rules, policies, uh, acts, laws, or technology. But there is a, enough um, uh, communication before, there's open discussion, there is feedback loop, and that feedback changes the way we are doing, whether it's a law or it's a, it's a rollout of a technology. And then there is, of course, um, you know, the feedback loop makes it better. So when people participate, when people come together to solve problems, what happens is you get a lot of feedback at scale. And that feedback at scale helps us not only create initial champions, um, but also people who have participated in it. So they are stakeholders in a way. And that stakeholder helps us take it further. And, um, but, and I, I, again, that does not only apply to laws, uh, it applies to technology and anything else that we do. So the two-way participated governance model has really, and this has been our prime minister's vision that uh, you know, decisions should not happen around a small uh, conference room in New Delhi, which is our capital, and should, because it's finally going to impact a billion people. Uh, you know, a representation of that billion people should be involved with the decision making um, if that's going to change their lives. So, um, and we've seen great results with that. If you involve people in, 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 in that process, the adoption happens very fast. And the other thing I do want to mention is we create champions very fast. So we, you know, we create champions or ambassadors. Um, you know, we have this, um, this concept of what uh, uh, vol citizen volunteers 
And there's a massive database, more than 20 million plus 30 million citizen volunteers who volunteer to do certain activities. And those uh, 20, 30 million volunteers uh, help us, as I explained to you, in certain areas, they help us do training, cyber training. In certain areas, they help us take technology. Now, if you have somebody local coming and talking to you, somebody who's right next to you in your language, and they, that person in himself or herself is, you know, is acquainted with this uh, new 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 system, let's say we're building, they're able to do that better. And that's where this uh, whole um, uh, approach of solving bigger problems in smaller pieces has helped us a lot. Ad adoption of things have been fast. I'll give you one example in this. 2016, we built India's own payment platform. It's called U UPI, Unified Payments Interface. We used to do maybe about 100,000 transactions a month. Last month, we did 6.2 billion transactions. So, so if you see six years from 100,000, 0.1 million to 6 billion, which is 6,000 um, million. So you're talking about a 60,000 times increase in usage over six years. So, but it's, it's not just that some, you know, of course it's led on the top, led from the top, it's advocated and, you know, kind of um, uh, evangelized from the top, but it's it's adopted at the bottom. It's a uh, it can these numbers cannot happen if only the top of the pyramid use it. It's 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 now become most very democratized, and it is also with the help of all these citizen volunteers that we've created over the years, who come and volunteer their time. I remember you posted something during COVID about uh, the 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 government's uh, solution or technological solution to um, I think it was um, tracing the tracing app. I forgot what it was. Yeah, the, the was, vaccine it, certificate. Right, so and to, it went like to massive. give you an example. What we do with the vaccine certificate is, or the booking your vaccine, you actually can do it on WhatsApp in India. Now you imagine WhatsApp is, is so prevalent. There's so many people using WhatsApp out of the you know, 900 million internet users. I think 800 million would be using WhatsApp. So we made it so simple. And that, you know, and again, it's a very complex technology at the back end, but front end is so simple. And, and then we had these people teach each other. So our, our, our student volunteers went around and teach each other, add this number on your WhatsApp. Now suddenly a WhatsApp bot will start. You can say, download your certificate or book an appointment. And, and I think uh, that that simple technology, which has then been adopted and just the, the, the expansion of that number and telling people that this is a number available to you uh, through communication, of course, but through also people has really helped a lot. So yes, Carlos, you remember that correctly, my tweet on that, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, um, I'm thinking about, you know, how that accelerated and people um, took it on board I'm sure it has to do with some of the um, the things you're mentioning, so that, like the champions and the trust and adoption. Um, I'm thinking about um, the the theme of uh, how to sustain this type of innovation, so that you know, if if we do need to do uh, another booster shot or whatever, it, it not necessarily in this example of vaccine, but just in general, if when you release a technology or a solution for the population. How do you make sure, or how do you build the processes into it so that it's sustained over time, so that people well, just don't forget about that I app? I don't want to take away from Fernando's time, but let me ask, this is a brilliant question. Is it, are these technologies or platforms you're building one-time use, hmm. become shelfware or, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, pandemic oriented? No, the vaccination platform that India built, number one, we've given it to the world. We've made it open and 27, 28 countries have already started using it. Two, we've not, it's called a vaccination. It started with vaccination because I, the world needed it that time. You know, uh, India needed it to scale to a billion plus people. But today it's become a complete immunization platform. So, you know, it, the, the innovation now is how do you reprovision current technology for other purposes? Like think like a platform really, I mean, you know, you uh, all these big platforms we talk about started as a as an e-commerce engine, but now they're doing payments, they're doing they're doing um, you know, video streaming, they're doing so many other things. Now, if you have if your thinking becomes like that, and that's that's how can we reprovision same for other things, and that is also innovation in thinking. And uh, and I think 
uh, the Indian vaccination platform is a great example. It started with vaccinations, but now it's doing um, things in uh, complete immunization. And that complete immunization is uh, is going to, you know, you will have your records, digital records for, for, for the rest of your life with you. So I think um, uh, it's a reprovision of the existing technology for repurposing it in a way that it can be more innovative going forward. So uh, I think that's that's going to be an ongoing challenge always. That's really interesting. So finding a building into it the, the, the interoperability or, or, or ability for it to um, fulfill different needs from the, from the population, um, much like a, a private business, Fernando, where you, you have your first market and then you go to the second and third and fourth and then you've grown into a big thing. Yeah. And I think it, it has like these two sides, right? right? One is from the technology side, and how you think on interoperability and, and, and how to build open interfaces, but also has to do with how you set up the team and how you set up um, this, uh, this vision on and how you, you expand the platform over time. Right? It, it, it's an overarching a strategy that, that's, that's not only on, on that point in time. Um, and what, what usually happens is you start with one product as uh, a catalyzer for something much bigger as, as Arvin was saying. Um, and one of the challenges you face there, um, one, of, one of the products I was working with is in a little mobile payment uh, platform that's becoming one of the largest in, in Peru right now. And what end up in, ends up happening is that you'd need different tracks to address the present and the future on, on your different products. Um, and it's really interesting what happens there. It's um, we usually think us creating this, this ecosystem as natural extensions on what on what you're doing, but what ends up happening in reality is that as your products grow in scale, um, you have to devote more and more resources to actually maintain what you have right now, right? And 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 address or and, and give maintenance to your actual product. Uh, so having an parallel ecosystem that can be current, like constantly thinking on what's the next step, what are new features and how the, the new like ecosystem will look like, it's very healthy for when you wanna do this exp expansion naturally. So you don't, you don't um, remove focus for actually bringing a really good uh, experience to the customers you currently have, but at the same time uh, have a, a, a parallel track thinking around the future. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, I was gonna want to ask Arvin <laughs> a small question around that. Um, because before we entered the meeting, we were talking about like all the different interfaces you have as a front end, having a, a common back end. Um, but for that to happen, you have to customize each experience for different kind of customers, right? How does the team uh, that actually do that look in behind the scenes? How is, how is your team structured in, in terms of like designers and understanding customer needs and behind in, in technology? So uh, Fernando, uh, as I said, the core engine is, a, is always a digital public good. And, and now what we have is an approach of building as many APIs. So, um, you know, um, for example, is a, a telecom operator in India launched a, a, a phone, which was actually not an Android Windows or a, uh, iOS phone, it is SkyOS. And it, the experience was very different there. So that's where the question that you ask really comes into play. How do you make sure that the experience is something that, um, you know, it, uh, uh, it, it, it really excites the citizens? Uh, or are, what about the same technology being offered in an assisted mode in a kiosk in a, in a remote village or in a mobile van or in a bus where we uh, conduct camps? A lot of this um, design thinking in the government comes from uh, experiential uh, stuff. And uh, the platform that I talked about, MyGov, uh, Fernando, really helps in that. It helps take technology, the pilots, quickly to, uh, to a large audience and in a very diverse setting, and then see what the feedback yeah. is for us to be able to make changes and, uh, you know, and, and, um, and kind of uh, learn from it quickly. So. Um, that's been our approach. That's very frankly been our approach. So, um, but it's an on ongoing challenge. It's an ongoing challenge. We can talk about the successes, but there's always, 
you know, times that we have not done well also. So, uh, you know, and that's the startup culture. That's the cultural shift that the government also has got that, you know, it's like, I, in fact, uh, you know, generally you say you want an intense startup, so it's, yeah, and that's a very good ratio. In the government, uh, because of that failure, the fear of failure, you would not experiment, you would not innovate. The leadership of the country has ensured that that is okay. Failure is okay. And it does not go back in your, you know, annual performance review that, you know, this person tried to do something good and failed. Uh, it's just that don't do the same error twice, but try out and innovate. And that cultural shift has also helped in the government a lot. Yeah, I wonder, <clears throat> um, that's a, a really great point. We started talking about in, in the last session, but we didn't get too deep into it. But like the ability to fail in, in government, it's so difficult, right? Because you have limited resources, time and trust. Um, how do you, I'm, I, yeah, I, I like how you said that it's now part of the Indian government culture in a way. How do you make sure that that happens? And, and I'm also thinking about what Fernando said about building in the maintenance and the features um, to keep the ball rolling with, with that um, uh, solution so that it can actually grow into something that fulfills other needs. How, yeah, how do you um, continue um, to build on, on, on an innovation that you've built? And then um, how do you build that culture that you mentioned where you, you don't, you're not seen in a negative light if you fail, you're seen actually in a positive light because you're trying something new, something different so that you can offer something better for citizens and for, for any of you, Fernando or Arvin. Fernando, why don't you go first? Then I'll, I'll uh, if there's time <laughs> remaining, I'll, I'll answer that. Sure. Um, I think um, two ways, I, I, I think. One is going back to Arvin's point on if the leadership recognizes that um, failure is acceptable and, and they set up an example on how they themselves can fail and set up um, um, a safe space for, for the organization to learn, I think that that's a that's a huge step, and that's a game changer. Uh, but if not, and 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 you're constrained by uh, by this current thinking on on just betting on safe spaces, what you can create is smaller bets that have lower risk, right? Um, so, how can I de-risk this this big challenge in small chunks and start thinking on? small windows of failure, right? Uh, so what, what usually happens is that you, um, that companies or, or the government things on um, just really, really big projects. How can we, as Arvin said, compartmentalize that into smaller things, uh, into smaller uh, uh, challenges? Um, think, think, think of it as how startup uh, does the things. Uh, they, they, they built, the, those called MVPs, right? those um, <clears throat> those uh, minimum value of products that actually serve as a test on the market, uh, where you you don't al you allocate the minimum resources to get the maximum amount of learning in in that space, right? Uh, so imagine, I'm if I want to test a product, I'm not gonna launch, I'm I'm not gonna build the entire product. I'm probably I'm gonna just build advertising for it or a video or, or a demo video explaining how it works. So if I get uh, an acceptance rate, uh, rate that it's kind of high, I can continue to the next stage of product development. Uh, so I develop a small uh, amount of resources and de-risk a lot of what's happening next, right? Uh, I think that kind of mindset could apply in those kind of situations where um, failure is, is seen as something that, that's very negative. So how do you the risk and 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 lower your 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 bets. So de-risking by to get small wins by getting small fails. And yeah. almost like <laughs> you know, like you do learn a lot from the small fails, like you can continue to do little failures until you start getting an increment in the uh, in, in the learnings uh, and you start exactly. failing less. You yeah. You minimize the risk like uh, in, in small bets, but you maximize the learning. Mm -hmm. uh, Better said so than I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Arvind, what do you think of that? The small, think, small wins. 
Yeah, small wins are good. Small wins are good. But as you commented, in, in the context of India, what is small, right? I mean, probably if I call small, it's probably sometimes equivalent to many countries, many bigger than many countries. So um, I think sandboxes have helped us a lot, policy sandboxes as well as tech sandboxes and a combination of the two. And, um, and some rollout, especially in fintech and government innovation has been sandboxed and that has helped. But um, you know, that's a, you know, we do a, we do a little bit of uh, piloting and see whether it's working and modify the process. But, uh, you know, overall, if something works out great, does not work out, as I said, it's acceptable to fail, but, um, you know, sometimes the, uh, it's, you know, doing multiple pilots and pilots after pilots is also the enemy of execution. And, you know, this perfection will never come. If you have the conviction, like an entrepreneur, go go big or go home. It's a, and that's a, that's something we have we have done a lot. We've implemented at scale. Uh, something has not worked out. We've taken back. We've you know dismantled it. But mostly, we have gone big. We made sure that we put our resources behind it and make sure it's transformative. Um, and uh, you know, uh, and that's, I think that's a, um, that's something because we don't have the luxury of time. Hmm. Governments don't have luxury of time. There's a lot of, I mean, you know, India thankfully has a five-year election cycle. And there's a, whenever a government innovates, there's a lot of political equity at play. And when there is a political equity at play, and they, let's say there are governments with a smaller tenure, they need to quickly show massive results. If they're going to take a program first year, and then, you know, that also ties in with one thought about political transition. Is your technology good enough? Is your solution good enough? Is your innovation good enough that it will survive multiple political transitions? And, um, and I think if it is, if the answer to that, that uh, is yes, then I think it will always survive multiple transitions because it's a societal need. It's not just uh, a political need. But to put your political equity behind it needs a lot of conviction. And if you put a lot of political equity behind it and it takes three years to happen, by the time the new election cycle starts, it's, it's not going to yield the right results. A lot of government, uh, uh, government uh, innovation is dictated by political, uh, political outcomes also. So I think we need to make sure that the time is compressed. That's all. And I, <clears throat> We only have like five minutes, but I, I really like what you said um, in terms of transitions. And I'm going to pitch it back to you, uh, put you on the spot. And for now, you can answer too, but um, how do you design for transitions, transitional governments, if it's not the same administration? And you, when you went big, do you involve them? Like, how does it work? So I, I have live examples on this. So at the federal level, uh, you know, of course, there is a, there is a, you know, last seven, eight years, we've had the same government. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but at the state level, when we've implemented projects at the state level, at the, you know, uh, and some of these states are as large as I said, nations, uh, much larger than nations. Um, they've gone through political transitions, but they've survived because suddenly there is a user base. There's suddenly citizens who are dependent on that. And there's suddenly that there is a, there's a conviction that if you take this out suddenly from the citizens' hands, they, this is going to cause um, kind of, uh, I shouldn't say the word unrest, but this is going to mm -hmm. cause them a, a discomfort, uh, something that you're taking away, and that's not going to be good for your political future. So if you design with that in mind, that it becomes integral to the lives of the citizens, I think it survives all political transitions. I have, I mean, I can, uh, I don't know how many how many audience in this would know um, some, some of these projects in India, but I, we have a list of projects which have survived multiple pol political transitions where government, one government implemented it, the second interim government came for two years, they continued it, and now the original government is back and they're still continuing with it. So um, it is, it is. I think the design thinking of citizen at the center of it is very, very important. Government at your doorstep, how can you take it away? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've given something that they will really miss. And yes, uh, Fernando, last thoughts on on the from the design perspective on that. <laughs> no, totally agree. I, I think there there's a, a a good question to measure if a product is it's been um, successful or not. It's going back to to twelve minutes. If the product disappeared tomorrow, how would you feel? <laughs> no. 
-hmm. And it's, it's exactly, it works exactly in the public or, or, or the private sector. I think if you relate uh, correctly to the user needs and, and the user emotions, it's, it's going to be a lasting product. That's a great uh, way to end. Government should be creating products that if they disappear, people would really miss them, uh, hopefully. Um, we have one question um, that we I want to pitch back to you from the audience, and we'll take one to two minutes on it. How can countries share their knowledge in government-led digital innovation? Is there a possibility for the US Digital Service and the Indian National Informatics Center to share their learnings with each other? I'll expand that and say Peru and India, for example. So let me take a shot at it. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I personally believe that's a great thought. There is, there is a lot of uh, building blocks that are common. And I mean, there are certain initiatives, uh, the Digital Public Goods Alliance that India is part of. There is a GovStack Alliance, which we are building blocks for the world. And, um, and they're all open goods. They're digital public goods in an open manner. Now that brings about trust. That brings about that you know no country is has backdoors into this technology and is is, is digital common. So um, I think countries need to participate more in that, learn more in that. There's a lot of capacity building required, and you know shared knowledge. Knowledge exchanges have to be there. So um, so for example, um, Peru or Latin America um, absolutely welcome India. India has this approach of the world is our is our family. We are ready to share with everybody. From an India perspective, we are ready to share all our learnings and whichever are our open platforms to the world. Yeah, I can attest to that. I've been a couple of years uh, before in India, and it's like it's a very open culture and and uh, an innovation space. I really love that. Um, going back a little bit to, to the question, I think it, it also has to do with what use and use cases are we using that information for like what's the incentive be behind the, the collaboration um i do believe there's there's a possibility for governments and and, uh, and institutions to work together um but having a clear goal in mind and having a clear use case for them to start sharing especially this, starting with small bits of information i think it, it could be this the way to get the ball rolling in the first place Exactly. Uh, and I'm sure there's uh, a lot of initiatives out there, one of them um, for connecting governments in a different way, which is um, building that talent and developing that talent, um, is uh, two placements that we at the GevLab, MIT GevLab, is launching in the next few days. One of them is in the uh, government of Sierra Leone. Uh, um, they will be placed uh, with the this, uh, Freetown City Council to co-design and uh, sorry co co-diagnose and co-design a solution to a problem. Uh, they will be also with the director of science and technology and innovation um, there in Nigeria. Um, we'll have a placement with the um, uh, ease of doing business um, team um, uh, in the vice president's office. And they will be also co-placed in a ministry to be defined where they will be solving a challenge. These will open in the next few days and the placement will start in September and they will end in December. Um, it's a great opportunity for designers. So Fernando, I'm sure you know a bunch of people would be great for it. Um, Arvin, the same for you. And we're hoping to expand that to other countries um, next year. So we're happy to hear from you. If you wanna connect with us, sign up for our newsletter, um, connect with us on LinkedIn, connect with me, uh, ask me anything you want about this program, uh, and there are more also on other social media channels like Twitter. I want to thank you, Arvind and Fernando, for a fantastic conversation that I wish we could continue on for a very long time. <laughs> and I hope we can continue to, to connect as this topic grows and this momentum hopefully grows. We'll have more of these conversations once every month until the end of the year. And um, we're hoping to convert some of these into a podcast that we'll be releasing uh, soon to the, the end of the year to continue this momentum um, talking about governance innovation. So Fernando, Arvin, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you to the audience and we hope to see you on the next one. <laughs>